Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading, if you would please, to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 40, Genesis chapter 40. We're going to read verses 20 through 23, 20 through 23 of Genesis chapter 40. They're not lengthy verses. I'd like us to just read them in unison together this morning. But as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing to read God's word. And we'll read verses 20 through 23 of Genesis chapter 40. Beginning on verse number 20. Ready? And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler under his butlership again. And he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. And let's pray. Lord, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music today. It sure has been good to to hear the songs of God and to sing them together with the people of God. Lord, I trust that uh, they've come up as a praise to you this morning. And Lord, we thank you for being our God and for being involved in our lives. And Lord, we're praying now that you'll bless the special as it's sung, that Lord, once again, it will help prepare our heart to be good ground that the word of God will fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. With my whole heart I humbly seek you. Now use my life, O Lord, I pray. I yield my stubborn will completely. May your commandments light my way. My life, Lord, as yours to control. I give you my heart and my soul. I'll seek your will never mind. Rich treasure to find, give wisdom to choice as I make, along every path that I take, so when I complete life's race, well done you will sing. Your word has promised me the victory, and all I need to do is claim your strength to soar with wings as eagles, to walk, to run, and not to faint. My life, Lord, is yours to control. I give you my heart and my soul. I'll seek your will, never mine. Rich treasure to find. Give wisdom to choice as I make. Along every path that I take. So when I complete. I praise well done you will say so when I complete my praise well done you will say amen it's good Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word this morning. Lord, we would need your help this today, not only as I bring the message, but for each individual as they listen. We desire that your will be done in our midst here this day. Lord, I don't just want to 
bring another message and the people don't just want to sit and say they went to church. We want to leave in a few minutes and be able to say God met with us this morning. And so Lord, I pray that you would open our understanding and Holy Spirit, you would do what only you can do here today in our midst. Help us each and minister to hearts as only you can do. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. It says it's on, but I don't hear it very well. You hear all right? You're not even acknowledging that, so maybe they can't. Yeah, it's pretty low, isn't it? Yeah, bring, it, bring me up a little bit, would you, Dean? Thank you. It's a terrible thing to be forgotten. You know, when for many, many years we've had uh, two vehicles, and uh, most of the years that we've pastored, we've had two vehicles except for the very early years. And so we don't travel to church together. And there was a particular time we, uh, my wife gets home before I do, and she's home and getting dinner prepared, and I came home and walk in, and we start counting children, and we're missing one. Where's Andy? And we went back to church, and Andy's still asleep on the front row. <laughs> Forgotten. Probably could have left him there for the afternoon, but if you, if you ever wondered what's wrong, what, what's happened to Andy, that now you know. And um, he was left, he was forgotten at church. He, not quite as bad as our other son, who we were out with another family in California. We had uh, gotten tickets to go see the Phoenix Suns play the Los Angeles Lakers, and, and we got tickets, we drove out there to meet them, and we were all together in a big van, and... and uh, or was it the station wagon? I think it was the station wagon. They, this family had four boys, and of course we had three kids, two boys and a girl. And uh, so we're all together in this vehicle, and we had some uh, food at McDonald's, and we, we went to leave to go to the game. This is Los Angeles, California. And we leave to go to the game, and we're driving down the road a few minutes away from the restaurant, and the boys are you know messing around, and one of them says, where's Nathan? Nathan's... Four? Five, maybe? And uh, come on, guys, quit clowning around, man. He's back there. Nathan, get up. No, no, really, he's not here. And we stopped the car and looked, sure enough, he's not there. <laughs> we all got in the car, everybody there, let's drive away. And Nathan's still back at McDonald's, a five-year-old kid in Los Angeles. And we drove back there, and he was sitting there talking to some lady. And uh, he, was, he was fine, as far as we know. And uh, forgotten. John Hopkins did a research about things that people most often forget. Number one on the list, names. Names. And uh, you, ever, you ever been there? Somebody walk up, they know you, and you're, trying to, you're going through the, the Rolodex of your mind trying to figure out who this is. Yeah, man, good to see you. How you doing? Yeah, good, good, good. How's things? <laughs> and... Uh, you walk away and your wife says, who was that? Why introduce me? Because I don't remember who it is. <laughs> you ever been there? 83% of the people forget that. Uh, second on the list was people forget where something is. You ever put something away and say, I'm going to put it there so I know where it is when I need it. <laughs> and then you need it and you can't for life remember where it was you put it, where your hiding place was. Uh, words. Words. We forget things we said so you you told me that I could do that I did now I don't believe a teenager when they say that but <laughs> anyway that's what happened to Joseph he's in prison and in prison he meets the butler and the baker that worked for Pharaoh and both these guys have a dream and they don't understand what the dream means. So they go to Joseph, and Joseph is able to interpret the dream. It's good news for the butler. He's the first one who gets his dream interpreted. And Joseph tells him, in three days, you're going to be lifted out of prison, and you're going to be restored to your position. Well, when the baker heard that, he said, okay, that's a good thing. Let, let me hear what mine is. He said, well... 
in three days, he's going to lift your head off your body. And the birds of the air are going to come have a field day with your head. Well, he didn't like that too well. But the butler's happy because he's going to get his job back. You know what he tells Joseph? Man, when I get out of here, I'm going to say something to Pharaoh about you. You're going to, you're going to get your pardon, man, because you were in here wrongly. You were falsely accused. Man, you're getting out. Get ready. Man, I won't forget you. And he got out. Are you, is your Bible still open? Verse 23. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him or forgot him. And by the way, verse chapter 41, it came to pass at the end of two full years. Then Pharaoh dreams a dream. Well, he waited two years to be remembered. And he never was remembered. He was forgotten. And boy, we're all prone to forget, aren't we? You ever, you ever told somebody you pray for him and you forgot about it? You ever, you ever forget an anniversary? Or forget an important event? Or forget something you were, where, someplace you were supposed to be? It's never a good feeling to forget, but it's even a worse feeling to have been forgotten. And I don't know what Joseph felt like when he was in prison. Hoping any day now the word would come. Maybe every time that door opened, he felt like it would be somebody from Pharaoh's palace coming to free him. But it never happened. There's three people, I think, that I want us to focus our attention on this morning that I think the church has a tendency to forget. And when I say the church, you don't understand who the church is. Who's the church? Us. <laughs> okay? There are people that we tend to forget. Number one is the missionary. The missionary. A couple's called by God to go to a foreign field. Oftentimes, though, they'll, they'll have to try to continue to work their job for a little bit while traveling to churches, much like uh, Xavier and his wife are doing right now. They're in Virginia for a meeting this morning and still working his job and still trying to travel because why? You've got to raise some support from churches to say, we'll help you go to the field to Siberia and preach the gospel. They'll have language school to go to. And eventually they'll leave and move to another land, thousands of miles away from America. And after being there for a few weeks or a few months for sure, they'll be forgotten. Too often the missionary is forgotten. In fact, someone wrote this, and I want to share it with you. You won't ever see this in a missionary letter. You'll hear stories of fun things and great times. We will be upbeat and happy and post photos of our family. You won't see us posting videos of us crying or hearing us complain about missing friends, but we do. But the harsh thing is that they do not miss us. This fellow says when we were planning on going to the mission field, we interviewed ten different missionaries' family. Missionary families. We talked to missionaries who were single. We talked to missionaries who were married. We talked to missionaries who were married with kids. And we talked to older missionaries. And we asked them, what is the hardest part about being a missionary? And their answer, all ten of them, without knowledge of what the other ones had said, all ten of them answered the same answer. Loneliness. Loneliness. After the first year, people totally forget about you. Even your best friend doesn't communicate with you. Several missionaries said we really tried to fight against it using Facebook and social media along with monthly communications and blogs that we could stay in touch with our friends. But we were surprised at how quickly they did not want to stay in touch with us. We understand lives are busy and we've moved on. But the truth is, understanding why something happens to us 
doesn't make it hurt less. It goes along with the what they said. Uh, the, other, the second thing about being a missionary is never feeling a part of the culture of the country you're living in. We don't feel like we have a home. But we do feel like those from our previous home have forgotten us. You know, they're not alone. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi in Philippians chapter 4. He said, No church communicated with me except you. That's the slave ball paraphrase. But he said, no one, can, no one communicated with me giving and receiving, just you. He had one church that remembered him. What about Ephesus? What about Thessalonica? What about churches of Galatia? What about all these churches Paul helped start? He said, none of them communicated with me. What? Lonely. Forgotten. Out of sight, out of mind. How do we, how do we keep that from happening? How do, we, how do we keep the missionary so they're not forgotten? Well, number one, we pray for them. Pray for your missionaries. That's why we take the, 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 the pains, I can say, I guess, to make sure they're listed on the Wednesday night prayer guide. To make sure we list those missionaries. It's a full, full page of them now. So you can go down and call these names in prayer. And you can pray for them. Hey, they need the help of God. And that helps us not to forget about them. Because we're calling their name in prayer. And if they're going to get help from God, the only way they get help from God is through prayer. And missionaries come through sometimes and they say, you know, yes, they need financial support, and we'll talk about that, but you know, they really do need prayer support. And that prayer support means you're thinking of them and you're asking God to help them. And they need the help of God. We all do. And so praying, someone said, in fact, Paul told the church at Philippi, he said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, making mention of you in my prayers. How, did, how was Paul thankful for the church at Philippi? Because I mentioned you in my prayers. He could thank God for them because he remembered them. How can he remember them? Because he prayed for them. There shouldn't be a missionary that we support ever walk into our church without numbers of people saying, I know who you are. Good to see you. I pray for you. That name ought to immediately ring a bell. Say, yes, I prayed for you. And when you call that name, if you pray for that missionary once a week, if you divide those 77 missionaries up and, and you pray for for 10 a day for 7 days or 11 a day for 7 days and you pray once a week for that missionary you pray for that missionary 52 times a year you're going to remember their name when they walk in you're going to be glad to see them and you'll be able to, to, to be a blessing to them someone said no one ever had to back up who went forward on their knees and if the devil can beat you in prayer he'll beat you anywhere That's why Paul told the church in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 3, 1, Finally, brethren, pray for us. Pray for us. Prayer is important. So we pray for the missionary. That will help not to be forgotten. The second thing we do is we support the missionary. Support them financially. Go to Philippians chapter 4. I'll, I'll reference that verse we said earlier. New Testament, the book of Philippians. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, then you have Galatians, Ephesians, then Philippians, and chapter 4. Verse 15 is a verse I referenced earlier. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once again unto my necessity. Now watch. Not because I desire a gift, not because I need your support, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. When we support the missionary financially, then whatever God can accomplish with them and through them, it also goes on to our account. How cool is that? We get to be a part of that. 
we get to have a part in that ministry. We, God, God blesses that. They're taking the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. And you and I can't all physically do that, but we can support those who are doing that and help get the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's our job, remember? That's the Great Commission. That's what all of us are supposed to have a part in. And so we, we do that, and when you pray for them and you support them, you won't forget them. You know why? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Okay? When you invest in missions, you're going you're gonna to remember them. Okay? You'll know about it. You'll not forget the missionary. But there's a second person that I think we have forgotten. And that is the lost man. The lost man. In many churches today, the lost man has been forgotten. You can fill up the calendar of the church with picnics and concerts and sports activities and fellowships and never endeavor to win the lost to Jesus Christ. I'm thinking of the lame man at the pool of Bethesda in the Gospel of Luke and Jesus comes and He said, do you want to be made whole? Well, He laid there 38 years. You just want to know, you, you satisfied to stay here? Satisfied to live this way the rest of your life? And the sad words that came out of that man's mouth is, I have no man. When the water stirred to take me down and get me in the water, others go down before me and I, I never get in. I have no man. Did he not have any family? Did he not have any friends? Was there no one around that ever cared about him? That's the saddest word. Uh, the psalmist said it this way, No man cared for my soul. That's a sad statement, isn't it? I don't know. I don't, I don't know about the folks in our area here around our church, but you ought to know one thing. There's somebody over there that cares about our soul. That we care about the lost. We care about getting the gospel to the lost. Forgotten by family, forgotten by friends, forgotten by others. But thank God He wasn't forgotten by Jesus. And Jesus healed him that day. I want to read you a letter that a high school girl wrote to a church. I attended your church yesterday. And this, a friend had invited her to go and she said, although you invited me, you were not there. I looked for you hoping to sit with you. But I sat alone. As a stranger, I wanted to sit near the back of the church, but those rows were all packed with regular attenders. An usher took me to the front. I felt as though I was on parade. During the singing of the hymns, I was surprised to note that some of the church people weren't singing. Between their sighs and their yawns, they just looked at their cell phones or stared into space. Three of the kids that I had respected on campus were whispering to one another throughout the whole service. Another girl was giggling. I really didn't expect that in your church. The pastor's sermon was interesting, although some members of the choir didn't seem to think so. They looked bored and restless. One kept smiling at somebody in the congregation. There were several people who left and then came back during the sermon. I thought, how rude. I could hear the constant shuffling of feet and doors opening and closing. The pastor spoke about the reality of faith. The message really spoke to me. And I made up my mind I was going to speak to someone about it after the service. But utter chaos seemed to reign after the benediction. I said good morning to one couple, but their response was less than cordial. I looked for some teens with whom I could discuss the sermon, but they were all huddled in a corner talking with themselves. My parents don't go to church. I came alone hoping to find a place to truly hear truth and feel some love. I'm sorry, but I didn't find it at your church. I won't be back. 
That's tragic. Who's concerned for the lost in Grove City? Who's concerned about the lost in Columbus, Ohio? We mentioned it on Wednesday night. That's our job is to get the gospel to the lost. How about the lost family member? Your lost family member. Lost husband. Lost wife. Lost brother. Lost sister. Lost mother or dad. Lost son-in-law or daughter-in-law. You know, the Bible says Andrew, when he got saved, when he met Jesus, he first went and found his own brother and brought Peter to Jesus. Well, we read a lot about Peter in the New Testament. You'd have never had a Peter if you didn't have an Andrew that brought him to Jesus. Co-workers. People you work with every day. And, and you understand, they're either, listen, there's only two kinds of people in the world. Saved people and lost people. That's, that's what the Bible teaches. you either saved, you know Christ is your Savior, you're on your way to heaven, or you're lost, you're without Christ, and you're on your way to hell. The only way to get off that Broadway that leads to hell is to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. See, that's the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Well, Pastor, I think I just live a good life. I'll be okay. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, Pastor, you understand, I go to church. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I was listening this morning on the way into church. The preacher on the radio said something very interesting. Hadn't quite thought about it this way before. You can take, take everybody who's ever lived up to this point on the earth. Take all the people that are living right now on the earth, 7.5 or 7.7 billion. And take all the people who are yet to live on the earth. If you could put all those people together and then, listen, get all the best things about them, the best characteristics you can of each one of them or any one of them and put them into one person you still wouldn't have anybody good enough to go to heaven. They still would come short of God's standard of perfection. There's only one who is ever perfect, and that was Jesus Christ. And the Bible says God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us when he knew no sin that we might have the righteousness of God in Him. That when Jesus died on that cross, He had my sins, He had your sins on Himself. He was taking our place. He was being punished for you and me. And when you put your faith in what Jesus has done for you, and you say, Jesus, I'll trust you as my Savior, God takes the perfectness and the righteousness of Jesus and He puts it on your account. And when Jesus looks at me, He doesn't see me. When God looks at me, He sees Jesus. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, He doesn't see you anymore, your sin. He sees Jesus. We're dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Oh, my friend, if you're here today and you're lost, you're not sure if you died, you go to heaven. Change that today. It's simply by calling on the name of the Lord, putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, boy, that's simple. Aren't you glad it's simple? I mean, I, if I have a choice between simple or hard, I'll take simple. Okay, I'm okay with that. If I like hard or easy, I like easy. Okay, and, and so I'm glad, hey, easy for us. It wasn't easy for Jesus. He paid the price so we could have eternal life as a gift. Let's not forget the lost man. Let's not forget the missionary. Let's not forget the lost. And then let's not forget the Son of God. Let's not forget the Savior. Hosea 8 and verse 14, the Bible says, Israel hath forgotten her maker. 
The church of Ephesus had to be rebuked in the book of Revelation. Why? Because they lost their first love. They lost their first love. They get, and it's so easy to get caught up in, in all the other things that go on and all the other political correctness and cultural correctness and uh, social gospel and all these things that happen that we forget Christ. Hey, He's to have the preeminence in all things. He's to be the one that we look to. He's the one that's to be lifted up in our service. We don't want to forget Jesus. The Greeks came to the feast in John chapter 12, I believe, and they, they said, Sirs, we would see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. And our job is to lift up Christ in the church. Whenever we come to church, I tell you, you want to see, hey, as nice as the choir is, you don't want to see the choir. As good as the orchestra plays, you don't want to see the orchestra. As, as mediocre as the preacher is, you don't want to hear the preacher. But I tell you who we want to see. We want to see Jesus. Hey, lift Him up. Hey, Sunday school teacher, lift up Jesus. Hey, nursery worker, lift up Jesus. Hey, usher, lift up Jesus. Hey, deacon, lift up Jesus. Hey, instrumentalist, lift up Jesus. Hey, choir members, lift up Jesus. That's our responsibility. We don't want to forget why we're here. Jesus is the head of the church. So let's remember Jesus Christ. Remember the person of Christ. Who He is. He's the Son of God. He's the Savior. Not a Savior. He's the Savior of the world. He's not one of the many roads. He's the road. He's not one of the many ways. He's the way. There's no other way to come unto God except by Him. He's the only way. So let's remember the person of Jesus. Let's remember the power of Jesus. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Power. He had the power to, to have lame people walk. He had power to make blind people see. He had power to make the deaf hear. He had power to be able to speak to the seas and the winds and the storm and, and a calm would come. He had amazing, incredible power. Power to make crazy people sane. Power over sickness. Power over disease. Power over the heavens. Power over death. And thank God He has power to save a soul from hell. He has power to forgive our sin. I love the song we sang this morning, My Sin. Some of you are still milling about talking. That third verse is a great verse. That third verse of of it is well with my soul, my sin. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. Past, present, future, all of it. Is nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. Isn't that good? I don't bear my sin anymore. Jesus bore it for me. The, the power, can, can He forgive sin? Yes, He can forgive sin. He's got the power to forgive sin. I want to forget the power of Christ, the person of Christ, and the plan of Christ. The plan of Christ is pretty simple. You know what He said? Each one of us ought to reach, each one ought to reach one. You know what He said? He looked at those followers of His and He said, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Who's going to take the gospel? Will it be angels? No, it'll be us. Oh, I think the angels were ready. After all, they announced His birth. In fact, before His birth, when, they, when, when it came time to tell Mary that she was going to have the Christ child, it was an angel that came, Gabriel. When it came time for His birth, the shepherds were in the field and in the sky was a multitude of the heavenly host announcing the birth of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was here on earth, after He was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, the Bible says angels came and ministered to Him. At the crucifixion, Jesus said, 
Don't you know I could call 12 legions of angels right now? They deliver me. That's where that song came from. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and for me. See, angels were there. When he was buried and they put him in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb and the women came out and they found the stone rolled away. But there were angels sitting there, weren't they? The angels announced the resurrection of Jesus. And when 40 days later came and He ascended back to heaven, it was the, they looked up as they watched Jesus go up into heaven and angels appeared there. And the angels said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you shall so come in like manner as you have seen Him go. Angels, 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 angels. And I'm sure when it came time that God says, Okay, now son, we're going we're gonna to get this message that you died for the sins of the world and this message has to go to every creature. This has to go to the othermost part of the earth. I'm sure the angels got themselves ready and said, Okay, man, we're set to go. And God says, No, sit down. What? I'm not going to use you. You're not going to use us? No. What are you going to do? I'm going to have them tell them. I think the angels went. Huh? Angel says, you kidding me? I don't know that happened. I'm just thinking that happened. There's no Bible verse for that. But Do you understand? And, and that's the plan. Go ye therefore. And preach the gospel to every creature. Sometimes I'll ask people if they witnessing to them, and if you know if you die today, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? And sometimes they'll say, well, that's a, that's a private matter. And I'll tell them, well, listen, I said it's a personal matter, but it's not a private matter. Because Jesus told me, and sometimes I'll, I'll open up the Bible and say, go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. I said, Jesus commanded me to go, so it is my business. And it's never private. It's personal, but it's not private. I've never met anybody yet who truly knew Christ as their Savior that was ashamed to admit it. If you know Christ your Savior, you're, you're, you're willing to tell somebody about it. Tell somebody about it. That's what the Lord intended for it to do. That the, those who've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, those who've been forgiven of their sin, would freely tell others how wonderful it is to be a Christian. How wonderful it is to be forgiven. How wonderful it is to know you're on your way to heaven. And people will receive the message. The songwriter said, Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. Weep o'er the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing. If we don't tell them, who's going to tell them? Somebody said, well, if, if I don't go witness, am I going to go to hell? No, but somebody else will. If you forget the missionary and you don't pray for them and you don't support them, will that send you to hell? No, but somebody else will. Somebody else will go to hell. Oh, let's not be forgetful. There's only one thing worse. Somebody says one thing worse than being lost, and that's being lost, and no one's looking for you. There's so many lost around us. Who's looking for them? I never, I never, I never have a Saturday to go by, and I, I, I blame it on my dad, you know. I grew up in a sports family, and I'm a sports fan. And I watch football on Saturday, and, uh, and, and I never look at those stadiums full of 100,000 people and wonder how many of those folks know Jesus Christ as their Savior. How many of those folks are saved? How many are lost? You ever think about that? Just the, the, the and, and listen, you don't, it's not about the masses. It's about reaching one. Just, Lord, give me one. What would happen if in 52 weeks, everybody in here just said, Lord, just give me one? Hmm? Huh? And 
Where would we put everybody? Think about that. Because then this would double, and then if in, if in 2020 everybody won one, that crowd would double. And all of a sudden, it's not adding, it's multiplying. And that's the way God intended for it to work. Now, it hasn't worked that way because we haven't done the job. The angels were probably right. But let's lift up Christ. Let's follow his plan. And that is to go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. So, let's remember the missionary. How do we do that? By praying for them and supporting them. Let's remember the lost. We do that by soul winning. By giving the gospel to those who need to hear about Jesus. And then, remember the Son of God. His person, His power, and His plan. Let's not make them the forgotten ones. Amen? Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth here this morning. Lord, I thank You for Your Word. Lord, I'm asking You this morning that You'd make us mindful it's so easy for us to get self-enveloped. To think everything revolves around us. And Lord, we forget those who have gone to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. How sad that missionaries must deal with loneliness. Help us, God, not to be a church that forgets about the lost. All around us, everywhere we go, people we meet. I don't want anyone around our area to say, no man cared for my soul. I know they may not agree with us, I may know not like us, but Lord, they ought to be able to say they do care about me over there. They've tried to tell me about Jesus. And Lord, help us to not forget about our Savior. It's never about a building. It's never about a program. It's never about a denomination. It is about Jesus Christ. Help us to lift him up in our lives. That others would see Christ in us. The power of Christ. The person of Christ. And the plan of Christ. 